Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your part number 4 of the test number 6 that we had conducted on 30th of March. So before we begin the test discussion guys, I hope you have checked out the special price offer of the PMF uh, IS Test Series. If you have still not checked out guys, there is a link in description below where you can go and attempt all the tests by yourself. These, there are 1000 high quality MCQs that we have prepared at a very special price of 499 do check it out before the uh, before the offer expires link is given in description below okay so now the question number 61 which was asked in your test was with respect to the district mineral foundation which is also called the dmf right now this particular question is important um, because we have seen lot of lots and lots of questions are coming in fact in the previous year questions we have got few questions with respect to the mining sector as well. So that is why this question becomes really important. So what exactly is district mineral foundation? Let's try to learn that and then we'll come back. So if you, if you, uh, the few points that you need to learn about the district mineral foundation called the DMF. Number one, it is a, no, it, uh, it is set up as a trust, keyword number one. Number two, it's a non-profit body set up by the state government this is another key factor that you have to remember because sometimes you may be you may be uh, uh, you may get a, an option which says the these foundation these kind of things are set up by the central government so it is all by the state government and district mineral foundation is set up in in all the districts which are affected by the mining works and that makes sense why the power is given to the state government because we have to create these bodies district wise. Now, as of now, the district mineral foundation, they have been set up in six, 644 districts of 23 states, uh, those states which are heavily affected by the mining works. And as per the, uh, as per the Amendment Act 2015, which is Mines Mineral Development Act, all the DMF are set under this particular section 9B of this act where we have got all the uh, regulations with respect to mines and minerals. Please remember these district mineral foundations of course they are funded and from that fund only we are going to uh, compensate for all the damage done by the mining right. So all the money that comes to the DMF it is it is always made a non-lapsable fund. Non-lapsable if you are not able to uh, spend the money at one particular stretch or one particular financial year then of course that money can be carried forward for future expenditures and these DMF are separately set for each district so that every district can be compensated properly with respect to the uh, all the all the damage done by the mining works. How it is funded? The DMF is funded through the contribution from the miner themselves they only contribute. So as per the rule the mining companies are required to pay 30% as a DMF of the royalty amount of the lease is granted before 2015. But if you have got the lease after 2015, then only 10% of that lease granted uh, uh, can, be, can be paid as a DMF. So that is the way the government is planning or the government has made this provision of compensating the local population for all the negative effects of, of the mining that happens. Very interestingly, this entire operation and composition of the DMF, it comes under the jurisdiction of the state government like I told you. But here the central government has also a small role to play. The central government can still give the direction regarding the composition and utilization of the funds because ultimately these DMFs are expected to implement the Pradhan Mantri Khanij Kshetra Kalyan Yojana. Khanij is mineral. So all the areas having the mineral areas, the government has this broad umbrella framework where every mineral uh, uh, occupying area needs to be compensated for the negative effects of mining, right? And at least among all the funds of the DMF, at least 60% of the funds are to be used in the high priority areas, for example, making sure that drinking water supply is there in that area, health care, sanitation, education, women, child, welfare of the aged disabled people. These are some of the priority agendas which, which are on which 60% of the funds needs to be spent minimum. Up to 40% of the funds are to be spent 
for creating supportive and conduct conducive living environment and we also have to make sure of all the funds of the dmf not more than 5% can be used for administrative expenses and that is very very a very good provision that we have in dmf you are not supposed to spend all the money on administrative expen expenditures only because that is not going to benefit the local people right so the fund itself make sure majority of the spending is to be done for the welfare of the people affected by the mining and that makes this provision absolutely important now if you look at the question guys the question was asking about to figure out which statements are not correct about dmf the first is correct the third is correct the only problem was the lapsable you we have just learned the dmf is a non lapsable fund okay so that makes the uh, uh, answer to be only two that has to be the right answer well this question was a medium level question and there is a logic why lapsable fund should be eliminated see when whenever you are making uh, you know like welfare schemes or something welfare schemes or something some some foundation or uh, you know funds for the welfare of the people sometimes it is not feasible to spend the money in one stretch so in general not just this foundation in general you see government make sure that these because these funds are like continuous uh, uh processes right so they cannot be lapsable because if lapsable fund they will create it is actually disrupt the continuity of the scheme so that's why lapsable has no logic to be a part of that and i i, I already told you the state government has to be the right one because ultimately you are setting setting up these uh, as the name says district mining mineral uh, uh, foundations so as the name says for the district the best case scenario is that you give power to the state governments okay that 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 make logic that makes sense why central government is not a part of it so it was a medium question but could have been attempted by simple by simply uh, applying the common sense and you know that the minerals are under the jurisdiction of the state governments question number 62 was with respect to the convention on biological diversity very famously called as the cbd so let's see first few things that you need to remember for that i think it was a very simple straight forward question we all know the cbd is a multilateral treaty that was adopted in at the 1992 rio earth summit very landmark summit you must prepare this summit in detail because it it was the rio earth summit from where the the legal concepts the major concept of sustainable development the environment production all these kind of things have actually tripped down from this rio summit before that 20 years back in 1972 there was a stockholm conference also but that was the beginning where this kind of thing started but it was the rio summit that actually shaped the, all the legislations with respect to sustainable development environment conservation and all these positive things that you can think of talking about the cbd this is one very important uh, treaty under the rio summit why because it is legally binding like there are very few international treaties you you must be knowing that which are not like majority of them are not legally binding they are voluntary in nature but what what makes cbd so effective is that it's a legally binding treaty number 1 is india part of that of course india is a part part of this uh, treaty there are 195 un states and the european union which are party to this convention well when you think of the cbd think of the three major goals number 1 it as the name says it talks about conservation of biological diversity that is what the name says right other than that how will you think about it how will you how will you conserve the biological diversity the best way to conserve is go for sustainable development that is sustainable use of the components of the biological diversity and then third how you will make the thing sustainable for for making something sustainable you have to go for fair and equitable sharing of the benefits that is arising from genetic sources so you see the three goals are there but the best way to remember is you you have to find the link between the three goals and then you can uh, you can easily uh, uh, remember the three goals so far there are two very important protocols that that have we have uh, adopted under the cbd and that is cartagena protocol biosafety 2003 and nagoya protocol on excess benefit sharing 2014 my suggestion is do prepare them also in detail 
and do expect MCQs coming on these topics. I mean every, all these protocols themselves are a potential MCQ. So do prepare them and remember both of them are within, under the purview, under the umbrella of the CBD. That is important. You look at the question, very straightforward, simple questions are there. So yes, we know that CBD is there under the Rio Summit and uh, yes, India's party and everything is correct. My one supplementary question for all of you I, and I want everyone to give the answer. In this particular Rio Earth Summit, one of the legendary was the CBD. But do you know, there are two more conventions, two more very, very important conventions, which were also uh, formulated after the Rio Summit. So can you give me the answer in the comment section box, which are the other two most important and we are still using the, these treaties, which of them are also created after the Rio Summit, somewhere in 93, 94. If you know the answer, do let me know in the comment section box. It was a very easy question, could have been attempted without any difficulty guys. Now you go to the question number 63. What is this question 63 says? Now this question is with respect to the conference of party 28 declaration on the climate and health. Very important question and uh, absolutely you have to keep a track of all the conference of party, the latest conference of the parties. You talk about the COP28, it was held in UAE. This itself can be an MCQ where you may, may be asked the latest, the COP28 was held in which of the following? They will give the answer. One, Egypt, two, UAE, three, Saudi, four, this, that, it can be anything. So be prepared, COP28, the latest one we have had in United Arab Emirates. COP28 is the first COP to host the health day and climate ministerial at the COP. So that actually makes COP one star more important for us. If let's say the question has, question says, which of the following conference of party was the first to do this, then answer has to be COP28. Okay, this COP28 summit marks, why, why, what is this 28? Every year we have this one conference of party. So COP28 means 28 years of this convention, right? So every time we are going to add one, COP28, 29, 30, that way. Now this COP28 uh, uh, marks the climate health nexus will be the focal point in negotiations. And that is one beauty that this COP has added to the cap of its, uh, you know, important declaration. And that is with respect, because so far we were only saying it, we were realizing it, but we have not legalized it. Now after this COP28, there is a legal recognition that there is a connection between climate and health. The, the more climate change, the worst health effects we can have. And this COP28 has actually made a legal provision for the negotiation and discussion by clearly establishing a link between the climate and the health. The declaration aims to promote sustainable practices within the health sector to contribute to the broader climate change. And this is how it is to be done. You have to take care of climate change to take care of the health. The more you take care of the health, the climate change automatically gets uh, gets uh, settled down. So both things are quite interrelated, number one. Number two, but India has not signed this so-called health and climate declaration. So be careful about that. Yes, I mean, this looks very odd. India usually sign everything like this, but please understand India's concern. And you really have to make sure that you remember this point. India has not signed this health and climate declaration. Why? India's concern was that you're talking about the greenhouse reduction because ultimately this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this new declaration talks about reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in the healthcare infrastructure. And India says right now we can't lower down our greenhouse gas emission in health sector because in India there is a growing demand for the medical services especially in the remote areas and underserved area and India really need to expand their healthcare. India really have to, uh, you know, build more infrastructure in this particular uh, field. And if India signs this treaty or declaration at this stage, it actually will bind our hands. We will not be in a position to deliver more medical services in re remote areas, underserved areas. Because ultimately, when you establish medical services, when you establish or expand healthcare infrastructure, of course, there will be some carbon emissions, right? India, that's why did not sign this treaty. 
and that is something you guys have to remember make sure you remember this and now here in this case both statements are absolutely correct right so yes India refrains from signing if it says India ratifies so be careful about that okay so both statements are correct uh, yes this was a medium level question and uh, I'm sure the first point was definitely a factual one but the second one is more conceptual you really need to think about this concept I mean I know in the very first instance people really think oh India must have signed that but in a reality you, you know this so take a risk but with logical calculation I'm not saying it is easy to attempt you can take a risk but with lo every logical calculation next question was very very factual very simple question simply the question asks you uh, which are the left bank tributaries of Godavari river so you have the options as uh, Pranhita, Manjara, Sabari and Ind Indravati let me tell you all of them are tributaries of Godavari but I am interested to know the left bank tributaries and this is something which people make a lot of mistake let's say if my river is going in this direction please understand it carefully if how to check the left right right, uh, right bank tributaries if the, if the river is going in this particular direction as the arrow says then you have to face your head in that direction okay the direction of the river has to be your face in that direction and your left becomes the river's left as simple so every tributary on this side every tributary contributing from this side becomes the left bank tributary and all the tributaries which are going and coming from the other side that that becomes the right side so the, this is the simplest way to understand put your face as the face of the river and the remaining left right you can uh, solve easily now if you look look at the question okay so here I would I, I want you to first look at look at this whole system guys look at this whole system that you have in front of you so clearly you can see this this is your Godavari river this Godavari river has its origin from the Trimbakeshwar hills in Nagpur district of Maharashtra and it goes to Bay of Bengal you know everything about it so this is your main river if, if I can make it little bit bold so this is your major Godavari river you can see okay this is your major or I, can, I should change the color as black okay so please remember this is your main river this is the main Godavari right and so everything that is on this all these all these becomes the left bank tributaries and these few are going to be the right bank tributary so clearly you can see one name that you have to figure out right here is the Manjara look at Manjara so clearly Manjara is a right bank tributary not a left bank tributary and on Manjara river you have very important reservoir called the Nizam Sagar reservoir on the on the left side you have all these famous Indravati yes you have the Pain Ganga Pranhita yes the this is your Sabri this is your Sileri the Vain Ganga, Varda, every contribute, every tributary of the river Godavari is very famous, including Purna, Dudna. And, and my suggestion here to every uh, uh, viewer out there always try to make these kind of diagrams. Always, this is the best diagram to practice and remember the whole drainage basin of a river. So, rather than simply marking it on the map, it is always advisable. You make, a, you make a free hand sketch of all this so that it becomes easy for you to remember right now if you if you look at the question you go back to the question guys you have the you have the answer in front of you so you clearly know which part you are going to eliminate and that answer is you need to eliminate the manjara manjara is clearly a, a right bank tributary we just have seen so answer has to be only three very easy simple fact based questions few things that you need to talk about and remember about Godavari Godavari is the largest system river system that we have in Peninsular India and that's why Go, uh, uh, Godavari is famously called as Dakshin Ganga if you have this question let's say which river of India is known as Dakshin Ganga it has to be Godavari the states are important so Godavari actually the drainage basin of the Godavari cover all the states of Maharashtra Andhra Chhattisgarh Odisha when I say river basin it, it is not necessary that Godavari itself has to pass from there any tributary uh, which is flowing through these state are also going to be considered as a part of the river basin so please remember that 
origin is very important of the river sometimes you have this match the following kind of things so you are given a river and its origin so remember like for example for narmada we remember uh, the for for narmada we have the uh, this thing are i forgot yaar uh, with 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 godavari we have tri, trimbak uh, trimbakeshwar and uh, then we have the amar kantak yeah amar kantak is the is the origin for the narmada right sometimes things get really off <laughs> the record so yeah with the amar kantak we have the uh, narmada river coming and trimbakeshwar is for that now i i have a question for you can you tell me the the origin can you tell me the origin of river krishna and also can you tell me the origin of river kaveri i am really interested to know these two answers as well in the comments box godavari we already have understood it is trimbakeshwar because all three are east flowing rivers all three have their origin in the, on, in the western side so really you need to remember all the three right okay that brings us to the question number 65 question 65 is about the global cooling pledge another important question with respect to the climate change environment very important question now very careful the question ask you which statement is not correct so be very careful with this correct and non correct kind of thing so first let's understand this cooling pledge a uh, global cooling pledge and then we'll come back to the question so first of all what is this so called global cooling pledge let's try to understand that so global cooling pledge is actually uh, it's a mandate the countries they have they they made a plan to cut down the cooling emissions by at least 68% by 2050 that is the pledge that is the that is the plan all the countries which are which are accepting this pledge now they have this target they have to cut down all the cooling emission cooling emission means cooling emissions is itself is a good uh, uh, you know way to have a one mcq on that basically cooling emission means all the emissions which are generated from the refrigerants and and that are used for energy or the energy used for cooling like like let's say your refrigerators your your air conditioners because every time you use these appliances there are some kind of emissions which are which are generated right and emissions from the refrigerants and other cooling appliances is what you call as cooling emissions so all the countries under the pledge they say we are going to cut down these so called cooling emissions by at least 68% at least 68% by 2050 that is the plan now as of now there are 63 countries including usa by the way they have committed to the world's first ever cooling pledge and where that happened this is again important this cooling pledge also has a relation to conference of the party 28 under un framework convention on climate change this itself is very important guys and let me tell you the question that i asked you in the in the first the second question that i asked you even this convention was the result of rio earth summit yeah this convention itself was the result of the rio earth summit that happened 1992 so what one answer i gave you another one you have to figure out and tell me in the comment box okay so currently uh, there is no problem with with respect to global emissions from the cooling sector as of now currently cooling emissions contribute only 7% of the global greenhouse gases but we can't wait for that that to become worse we know the way global warming is intensifying we know the demand for the cooling is going to go up at any any case in in every country the demand of the demand for energy for the cooling appliances is going up so it's always better to cut down the emissions right now where we can we can we have this uh, we have this control of you know cutting down the emission rather than waiting for things to go worst and then cutting down further so this is important that you have to remember number 1 okay so if you now come back to the question you see every statement is correct without any problem all the three statements of the schooling pledge are correct so which is not correct is none because all the three are correct um how to solve how to approach this question okay fine this question is very fact based i mean i cannot guess if it is 7% or not it says it is only 7% so gives us this impression this this can be incorrect another way 
is the cooling pledge where it where, where it again says lot of things about i can't predict i can't give a logic if it is 20 50 20 30 20 17 can be any year or it can be 68% 70% 20% is also not sure if it was a pledge of cop28 or not again a matter of cause so in my opinion this question was kind kind of medium but at the same time this question is not giving us the space to take the risk it's very every line has a factual information that i think it's a it's a skip kind of question if you are not sure don't take the risk unnecessary because every time every statement is not going to be the correct one so be prepared okay and that's how you have to refrain from taking unnecessary risk question number 66 is what we have next uh, question 66 is with respect to the national nationally determined contribution the ndc another important question with respect to the uh, environment and climate change so what are ndcs and what we have to remember let's try to figure out guys so when you whenever we talk whenever we use this word ndc nationally determined contribution so what exactly the ndcs are and what are their origin backstory is also important so we all remember the paris agreement right paris agreement landmark agreement of 2015 which was a legally binding international treaty on climate change and everything hap everything changed after 20 2015 paris agreement even today everything that we are doing is with respect to the Paris climate deal. This is absolutely important and I would say it's a landmark thing that you everyone has to remember. When this Paris climate deal was signed in 2015 that was adopted in conference of party 21 there we have decided that we really want that like like you know the best case scenario is if the world is able to limit the global warming to below 2% of the pre-industrial levels or at the best case scenario if we prefer to limit it by 1.5 degree means from the pre-industrial level the global temperature should not rise more than 1.5 or maximum 2 that should be the aim and for two and of course this is not something that one country has to do this is a global problem and so thus is the global target global aim so every country has to contribute every country has to take some some steps on their level then only we can have a global impact of of all the collective uh, uh, you know changes that the world is doing and for that purpose only the paris climate agreement said every country has to make their own ndcs you now you understand the background so what is an ndc it's a non binding climate action plan to cut the emission and adapt to climate impact and that is done by every country and every member of this convention so every country has to select and present their own ndc and there is one more requirement in paris, paris uh, agreement paris agreement says every country has to you know make their plan the climate action plan as ndc and also have to update that ndc after every five years why because the, at, this is a good way then only then only we can monitor the progress and according to our progress we can actually do some or make some changes right and they are they are the first greenhouse gas targets under the UNFCCC and that actually equally applies to developed and developing nation this is important guys a developing country can't escape itself by saying oh i am not going to make any action plan because i'm a small country I'm, or i'm a developing country no doesn't matter if you are a, if you are a developing country least developed country or a developed country every country has to contribute because global warming is not a one country problem it's a it's a problem of the whole world if the problem is global solution has to be global as well but at the same time it's not that every country has to contribute the same level of course every country has to make a plan according to their best case scenarios understand now please understand india has also submitted the ndcs very good but what india has really stand out as a country india has achieved two targets already we have achieved the two target we we submitted five targets in total out of the five the two we have already achieved well ahead of time and which were these two targets one with respect to emission intensity 
and another with respect to non fossil fuel uh, energy so let me let me give you this brief small idea of what exactly india has achieved so in 2015 that was india's first ndc india committed these two targets like there were total five targets i am just talking about the one that we have achieved so one of the five target was to reduce the emission intensity of the of its gdp by 30 35% and this is something we already have achieved we already have cut out our emission intensity and now after getting inspired by the success india has rather may, made a new target for itself now we have achieved this 30 35% now the target india has set for itself is 45% now we are trying as compared to 2005 level we are trying to cut down the carbon emission intensity by 45% by 2030 that is our new target that we have set for ourselves and this is what india has updated in august 2022 like because you see in paris climate deal you keep on updating your targets another target out of five that india achieved was to achieve 40% cumulative electric power installed capacity from the non fossil fuel based resources well india has also done that india has also achieved now uh, as of now as of october 23 uh, non fossil fuel capacity we already have reached 43% beyond the target of 40 and now that's why india has set a new target of 50% so now you have this clarity why india has updated what india has achieved be very careful with that guys okay now in this question yeah all the three statements are absolutely correct without any issue so yes these three are correct answer is all three easy question could have been attempted easily because ndc is something which is very popular and you are studying it since 2015 so you must be aware of all these informations okay this is this is important guys that brings us to the question number 67 another important question of environment and climate change talks about the nuclear energy for net zero emissions so let's first understand what is this nuclear energy for net net zero emission we know right we know this term very well what is a net zero emission guys well uh, net zero emission means it's not that i'm not going to emit any carbon net zero emission means the 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 carbon that i am going to emit i am making sure i am also absorbing or removing the same amount so my net emission becomes zero carbon em emitted is equal to carbon absorbed so that is my nuclear energy for net uh, sorry this is my net zero emission but what nuclear energy has to do with that we need to figure out guys this is important okay now if you look at the question net zero we already have understood So net zero emission is simply the balance between the amount of greenhouse gases produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. We are making a balance, and it is important to keep up the Paris Climate Deal target. Now, India has set this target that we are also going to reach net zero by 2070, where USA has a target at 2050, China is going to become net zero by 2060. Okay. and that is our target fine that that is fair enough and india india's updated target also i told you i already have mentioned now please remember to achieve this kind of thing now led by usa there are 22 countries including france uk canada japan south korea ukraine other there are in total 22 countries they have also pledged that they are going to triple the global global nuclear capacity by 2050 for a net zero emission at the cup28 this is a new development that took place india is a clear not not part of that so remember remove india please so india clearly abstains from the nuclear energy commitment because india really do not want to align in any alliance outside the cop process so india clearly is not into that energy nuclear energy commitment but there are 22 countries which are going to triple their nuclear global nuclear capacity and they want to achieve the net zero by by emphasizing on nuclear energy where india where india is targeting more to achieve this by solar energy by wind energy by hydro power electrical energy you understand so our way is quite different and these 22 countries they have this bulk excess of global nuclear energy and capacity so they are going to they want to go to 
uh, via the global nuclear capacity. And that's why their target is 2050 and our target is 2070. Okay. So this is important guys. So all the three statements are important and all the three statements are correct also. The question was asking about which, which statement not correct. But here all the three statements are correct. So answer has to be none because all are nothing is incorrect. All are correct. I would say this question was definitely a medium level question. Okay, because it is about the net zero. So at least first, first statement is very, very simple because net zero is what they have asked. Okay, you can always, you can always think as US promoting more global nuclear capacity. Okay, if there are 22 countries or not can be doubtful. But at least you can think that, oh, USA is the superpower and very much champion of nuclear power as well. So definitely, may, it, it seems like, it's quite likely that US may have started something like that. And third state is also, you can, you can predict with the logic. That do you think India is going to go into nuclear energy commitments? No. India still does not have the bulk of nuclear energy. And we are still not prepared for going with that heavy duty nuclear energy. And especially for net zero, though definitely not. So this looks quite advanced for India at this particular stage. Okay. So that makes sense that I can attempt it. Of course, with little, little bit caution. But I can still attempt this question. Because the options give you enough scope of applying some logic and getting the right answer. Next question is with respect to the pesticide poisoning. Which statement is correct with respect to pesticide poisoning guys? Now this is important. Okay, before I get into the detail, this question says India ranks first in pesticide production. Do you really think so? We are good at consuming but we are still not that good at production level. India is one of the largest consumer of pesticides given the agriculture scale that we have in India. But do you really think, logic, that we are also produce in production also we are number one? And forget about production, it, it, this statement says we are also first largest exporter globally. I mean this is too ambitious. This looks too ambitious. Production wise and export, export, export wise, we are not that super power, super giant now. I do not know the exact rank let's say. But at least I can be sure India is not supposed to be the first in these two. So at least I can eliminate my one statement from here. Make sense? Just by some, you know, common sense with some gut feel, you can still eliminate these kind of things. I'll come back to the detail. But now, as of now, the pesticides are concerned. We know what is a pesticide, you know, very basic definition. Pesticides is a substance that is used for pest control in agriculture, food production, animal care. And at the same time, of course, these pesticides has very negative health impacts. If you are consuming any food, anything in which pest control is used, pesticide is used, it is going to impact the health of the consumer. Can be nausea, vision impairment, photosensitivity, loss of stamina, life, death. It can be anything, guys. And unfortunately, if there is any poisoning that, that happens because of the pesticides, there is no antidote available in the market for most of the pesticide poisoning cases that eventually and always lead to death in maximum number of cases. Understand? Now, when it comes to India, of course, we are a huge consumer of pesticides. But India is second in terms of the production. And we are fifth in terms of the export level. Very interestingly in India, we have Maharashtra, right? In Maharashtra, there is a region called Vidharba. Vidharba alone utilizes 50% of India's pesticides are used alone in Vidharba. And that too for the cotton farming. Because we know the Vidharba region is all black cotton soil area. And 50% pesticides of India on a, on a pan-India scale is used alone in Vidarbha in that. Okay, so please remember this fact. So now clearly guys, that um, India, the second statement is wrong here. The first being right and second is wrong. So answer has to be one. So clearly the first statement is very simple and second is also very logical. So I am putting this in the easy category and everyone could have attempted that by simply reading the statements and going by a little bit of knowledge of things in general. Next is UPSC favorite guys, we have a scheme and you have the ministry in front of you. 
so you have the geoscience national geoscience data repository green hydrogen mission and startup councils okay uh, let's no not go into the detail you just apply your common sense think of green hydrogen green hydrogen is a fuel of future is a fuel of future we call it as a clean fuel green fuel if it is a clean fuel green fuel it is a renewable one right so make some logic oh it has to be ministry of new renewable energy quite possible of course i'm not going to associate it with ministry of petroleum because i'm talking about the future fuel green fuel clean fuel so this still makes some sense you think of startup startup means business business is commerce commerce means ministry of commerce and industry of course that still makes some sense but are you able to connect geoscience data with the ministry of science and tech this is not right i mean of course this is confusing but geoscience data is with respect to the mining purpose geoscience data is with respect to mining purpose not for any other purpose so we have this ministry of mines launched the national geoscience data repository it's a flagship initiative of ministry of mines as a part of the mineral exploration policy to 2020 2016 under this policy only we we have discussed the district mineral uh, foundations in the question number 1 so this geoscience data repository is under ministry of mines please remember that other than this the second and the third you can see is quite clear it is quite okay we have this national startup advisory council which is which works under the dpiit which is department for promotion of industrial and in internal trade that overall works under the ambit of ministry of commerce and industry one suggestion for all of you green hydrogen is going to be the next important topic for upsc preparation so do prepare this topic in detail what is a green hydrogen we already have explained many times and india is dedicatedly targeting to have at least 125 gigawatt renewable energy capacity with respect to green hydrogen so please read about it read about india's national green hydrogen mission it's going to be absolutely important star mark double star mark triple star mark upsc will ask you this question guys okay now this question again i say this question was not that easy it was a medium one but not something that you cannot attempt you can still take little bit of risk and you can still attempt it at least second and third has all the logical sense i know the first one is a bit tricky because geoscience science very very same same but it is not same same by the way right so now now you know the answer it is ministry of mines that you have to remember question number 70 is what we have next so question 70 is with reference to the special economic zones s e z special economic zone which statement is correct so of course you have to get into the details of special economic zone i i know we are we are really really uh, reading a lot about special economic zone it is not something new we have reading about special economic zone since 2000 when the special economic zone policy was announced as a foreign trade policy it was 2005 act where we got the special economic zone approved and finally in 2006 india has got the special economic zone but what is a special economic zone is something you need to learn special economic zone please read the name two time three time four time special economic zone they are designated areas where business enjoy the tax tariff and regulatory exemptions this is my entire state in the entire state i have this one particular area which i have designated as a special economic zone in this particular area every business activity is going to have lots of lots of support from the government by exemption of the tax tariff regulations so that this particular area can become the hub of the business can become the leader of the export something that we always envision as a special economic zone let me tell you india was one of the first country of the asia that have that have realized the effectiveness of the export processing zones and on that particular line 
India have India has got their first export processing zone way back in 1965 in the Kandla that export economic zone this you can say export processing zone you can say it's a predecessor of the special economic zone so initially we used to have this dedicated export processing zones and realizing that potential further in 2000 we we came up with the policy act was prepared 2005 2006 India has got its first special economic zone as of now special economic zone under section 8 provides for establishment of the international financial service sector IFSC that recently we have got one in Gujarat gift city I hope you remember we are the Gujarat gift city and in that we have got uh, India's first international financial service sector now very logically now you know that now remember this example again so out of this one complete state why I have demarcated this one particular area special economic zone what are my objectives of declaring it as special economic zone objectives are very clear every special economic zone is supposed to boost the economic growth number one because input cost is reduced it is always going to attract domestic and foreign investment because once you see the growth is happening in special economic zone investments will will pour down from the from the domestic and the foreign investors also it talks about promotion of export of the goods and services it also talks about creation of employment opportunities also talks about deployment of infrastructure facilities so everything is damn perfect this is this is a pro business environment no it's a pro business environment that we see in the special economic zone very very important please remember one interesting fact and what is that interesting fact again just make this diagram and this is my special economic zone remember so please remember the goods and services entering the special economic zone from the domestic market domestic market is any market which is outside the special economic zone this any goods and services entering the special economic zone from domestic tariff area they are going to be considered as export because technically technically special economic zone we don't treat it as a part of India special economic zones are treated as foreign entities or foreign uh, 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 you know foreign jurisdiction when it comes to the taxations when it comes to economics we consider them as a separate part not the part of main domestic market and that's why any goods and services that are going to get exported from domestic area into special economic zone are going to be considered as exports and if by chance and the same way if domestic market is purchasing anything from special economic zone that will be considered to the import you understand the logic because really we what we want we we really want special economic zones not to focus on domestic areas special economic zone has to have export sector into the mind so we really do not want much interaction between the special economic zone and domestic tariff areas if domestic markets are going to get engaged then they have to pay more price it is why why special economic zones are considered as foreign entities why there is export import uh, uh, this because both are within india because we really want to separate and ma make sure special economic zones are focusing more on the outer markets not the domestic market and that is why this system uh, is being made if let's say you have this question what exactly is domestic tariff area sir what is dta it means whole of india excluding the special economic zone this this definition itself is very very important guys dta is going to include ter territorial water also continental shelf also but special economic zones are not part of domestic tariff area so what to exclude what to include you really have to be careful about in this in this case now there is problem with the first statement is correct no problem they are designated areas business enjoy all that fine very easy option but what makes this question little bit medium level is the second statement it says the goods and services entering the special economic zone 
are they import no for special economic zone they uh, for domestic level they are exports but if the things are moving from scz they are going to other market places in india then they are going to be treated as import basically they have exchange import and export here so yes this question was an easy one you could have attempted but of course the level was little bit medium because uh, this concept of the second statement concept may be new for many many students now question number 71 is with respect to the sovereign credit rating very important question guys sovereign credit rating which statement is not correct is what you are supposed to talk okay now first let's 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 learn about the sovereign credit rating and then we'll come back to that i hope we all are aware what a sovereign credit rating is well if you go by the definition sovereign credit rating is nothing but an independent assessment of the credit worthiness of a country or a sovereign entity what about what is what this credit credit worthiness if let's say a very simple example if uh, if there are two people this is person a person b and this is bank or any kind of money lender okay if two people go to that to get the money of course the bank or the money lender they are they are going to check out check the background of these two people right if let's say the bank or the money lender finds out that this person called a has a very good credit worthiness this person has always paid the debt in time he is good with managing finance this person never default the loans so he has a good credit rating right he has a good credit score credit rating score and if look at the b b is a person having very bad track record like he never pays the money in time he is always into shortage of money he he always misses the payment it's some kind of record so tell me honestly to which person you would like to pay the money first or what is your priority in giving the money in choosing the two of course you will you are always going to go for a because a has more credit worthiness similarly think this example at a global level so every bigger investor investing company any foreign bank any investor bank or any foreign investors whenever they have to place their money to any country first they will always check out the credit worthiness of the country so credit worthiness is nothing but the ability to pay back the debt without the default and what ensure that credit worthiness are these ratings every country is given some rating like like normally we have a civil score a person at individual level we have a civil score a country's civil score kind of thing is like these ratings so these sovereign credit rating can tell about the level of the risk associated with investing the sovereign debt in investments and there are like there are many but there are three most influential uh, sovereign credit rating agencies that we have and 95 percent of the rating is done by these three countries uh, these three institutions SNP, Standard and Poor, Moody's, and Fitch. These three are most influential, most trustworthy ratings that we have. Number one thing that you need to learn. Of course, while while these companies, while these institutions, before they give a credit rating, of course they 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 check a lot of things. Before any credit rating, the economic growth, fiscal policies, public debt level, political stability external trade positions everything of that sort is observed and then the country is assigned some kind of rating please remember that and it is very obvious now now so far you must have understood the better rating means the more chances of getting the loan plus the better the rating the government can because government has a high credibility Better score means government has a high credibility and high credit and high credibility means I can get the money at comparatively lower rates as well. People are willing to give me money at even lower interest rates because they know I am going to pay back in time. So better the rating, the government can actually get cheap borrowings at a cheap bo borrowing means at a low interest rates I can get the money from the international bond market and also because I have a good rating 
that means my economic position is good i am doing well in terms of political stability i must be doing well in terms of my whole economic scenario economic setup that means there would be more people interested and in investing money in india and that also means the, even the fdi the foreign direct investments are going to increase if i have a bad rating less fdi costly credit i will get and i'm not going to get the excess easily of the global market okay please understand but at the same time at the same time there are lots of criticism also of these ratings what are the criticism i'll come back later first let's solve the question guys and then i'll tell you that everything is not right with these credit agencies there are some drawback as well so first statement correct second is correct here the third is not because it says the better score uh, uh, it is going to decrease foreign direct investment apply the common logic better rating better credibility more investments will come so we have increased fdi so this question very easy question very simple straightforward answer answer is to be 2 now many times these credit ratings are actually under heavy criticism why because there are and there are genuinely there are genuinely some issues with the rating agencies number one the qualitative factors in rating methodologies give rise to bend and effects and there is always the charges that these rating agencies they they have some kind of cognitive biasness i mean there are so many developed countries which still have a good rating very good rating despite the slowdowns how come their economies are still considered to be attractive and especially the developed countries why their rating are not uh, you know their their rating should also be lower down of course this whole rating agency ultimately what they use is the world bank worldwide governance indicator that is the base all this data is used by the rating agency and this these indicators they themselves are questionable they themselves are facing lot of criticism the method which are being used is not credit worthy and that's why that's why uh, the ratings has some problem in terms of international credibility at at certain points next question again we are into the mineral mining policy so the question is about the national mineral exploration policy 2016 this is the third time this particular topic is being repeated in this because of the high level of importance so think about national mineral exploration policy which statements are correct and then we'll come back to the question first learn certain basic fact guys you think of this pol this policy is important now as per this national mineral policy this policy is very landmark because it sets the target it targets the exploration of even the deep seated and concealed mineral deposits so far the previous policies they were not much keen in the deep seated mining this particular policy is also targeting these deep seated minerals and the concealed minerals also this particular policy is important because it proposed to undertake the quick aero geophysical surveys of the country and create the dedicated geoscience database this was your this was already a question guys right this is already a question of the mcq and especially the match the following kind of thing we already have covered that so now you know under this policy only we have we are we are planning to have this so called aero geophysical surveys and we trying to get a dedicated data for that now statement 3 that you will see is not going to be correct please remember this interesting thing it is ministry of mines that will carry out the auctioning process of the explore identified exploration blocks all the mines that are to be explored by the private sector the auctioning part auctioning has nothing to do with this data center or this policy auctioning dedicatedly to uh, dedicatedly to be done by ministry of mines that you have to remember and if you look at the statement 3 that is the biggest problem of this question so who carry out the mining uh, auctioning process auctioning is not the job of national center for mineral targeting no auctioning exclusive domains of ministry of mines so please remove the number 3 first and second are correct yes it talks about everything that i mentioned so yeah this level a uh, medium level you can take a risk especially in statement number 3 first and second though i think they are very direct statements 
and they can be answered without any problem in the very first instance, right? So here the answer is supposed to be only 2. So right answer is supposed to be B. Only 2 is the right answer. Okay, then move on to the question number 73. Now this question again is a bit tricky. Why? Because the statements are really tough. Question was with respect to credit guarantee fund scheme for micro small enterprises. And you have to tell me which statement is correct, which statement is not correct. Let's see. Okay, so first let's talk about this credit guarantee fund scheme for micro small medium enterprises. Please remember one thing very very carefully. This particular micro small enterprise, it's a, it, it is a central sector scheme. Be very careful. Which scheme is sponsored which is sectoral this kind of thing because it's a huge huge thing and that talks about the MSMEs of the whole of India. So to maintain the uniformity such kind of such level of schemes are always going to be central sector because the funding has to come from center 100% funding is to be given by center and that also not just the funding there's a requirement of the uniformity of the policy and that's why they are made a central sector scheme without any interference from the from the states. Why this enterprise was created? Simple, to make available the collateral free credit to the micro, small, medium enterprise. Because we know, not sorry, medium, not medium, micro and small. Only micro and small enterprises, they are going to get collateral free loan. Means without any bank guarantee, without any collateral, without putting something as a, as a, as a, a guarantee, you can still get a loan, you can still get a credit. And that is actually required for micro and small enterprise because out of the total MSME sector, 80% of the MSMEs are nothing but the micro small enterprises. And the biggest challenge of these small small business groups is the capital, the timely money they need to keep their operation running and also time to time to keep expanding their operations. This particular scheme talks about all existing and the new enterprise both are eligible but it talks about very important word is collateral free credit understand the kind of level of risk the the government is taking collateral free means if if any of the micro small enterprise they are not going to pay pay back so ultimately that is going to impact because uh, it's a collateral free so there is no guarantee of money coming back Remember this very interesting fact. Second thing, remember one more thing. Ultimately this scheme, the corpus of the scheme is contributed one by central government ultimately because it's a central sector scheme. So funding is to be done by a central sector bank and at the same time along with central, sector, central government we also have the small industrial development bank SIDBI. Now please remember few facts with me right here. Whenever you are thinking of micro small enterprises, always think of SIDBI. SIDBI is Development Bank of India supporting the small industries. Like for example, whenever you think of agriculture, you think of NABARD, right? Similarly, you think of any housing scheme, you think of National Housing NHA. So Na National Housing Board, NHB, right? So that way you think of small business, think of SIDBI. The funding, the corpus of the funding contribution is to 4 is to 1. So 4 parts by central government, 1 part by SIDBI. That is the setup guys. As of now, the MSME and SIDBI both establish a trust called as this credit guarantee trust for micro small enterprises to implement the, the, uh, the bigger scheme. So to implement this scheme, which is a sector scheme, we also have got a fund trust to implement that. So Statement number three only is correct, but now you know the problem with first and the second. Why first is not correct? Is it centrally sponsored? It is not. It is a central sector scheme. So that is one problem. And then look at the second problem. Second problem is, it says contribution by central government and the state. Are state government involved in this? No, sir. We have involvement of this SIDB a development bank, small industry development bank of India, SIDB. So that makes one and two are incorrect. Question, I would say it was a tough one. And you can skip this question or you can take a risk depending on your appetite. But this question was not easy. I understand. Only one statement is correct. So you can skip this, this question. 
because it has lots and lots of challenges. Question number 74 is with respect to the dark patterns. We already have covered one question as far as I remember. We already have covered one question on dark pattern recently. So what exactly is the dark pattern? Please understand. Here we are talking about some manipulative tricks. Sometimes you are forced to click on a link. Sometimes you are forced to buy something which you are not willing to buy. You are opening a shopping app. It says sale for one hour uh, like you know 70 percent off going to get end tonight so purchase it right now so that is all unethical behavior where you are tricking and pressurizing and manipulating your consumer to buy particular thing or to click that particular link all this unethical user interface design specifically created to trick manipulate users into some decision making that they otherwise would not do that. That is called dark patterns. Every online business use these dark patterns these days. So very straightforward question, very easy to attempt. Let, let me tell you a little bit more of dark pattern that is important. So now so far you have understood. There are so many dark patterns, we'll talk about that. What, but what is the basic definition of a dark pattern now you know. Every unethical user interface for for uh, making people do something that otherwise they would not do. It is nothing but a deceptive technique which is used to sway or change the behavior of the customer. And just the purpose is very simple. Purpose is not the welfare of the, of the, of the consumer. The purpose is simple to take some advantageous advantage for the business. It is only about serving the people, serving the interest of the, of the business, not the interest of the people. So ultimately, the dark patterns are also kind of violative to the user privacy and security because you are actually being deceived by the interface. And how did they, they do? Uh, how they do that? There are so many key dark patterns, and we don't even realize. You, me, every day, lot of times we are also swayed by these dark patterns without even realizing. For example, false urgency, sale, 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 sale ending tonight. Understand? So you may think, oh my God, if I'm not going to buy this to today, it will the prices are going to go up tomorrow. So I even even if you want it or you don't want it, you're still likely to buy that particular thing. And sometimes you must have noticed that sometimes when you are buying things online, certain things get added to your basket automatically without your knowledge. That is called basket sneaking. So that app very smartly they understand your shopping behavior and they are going to add few things automatically to your basket. Sometimes these apps or these kind of networks, they make you feel that you are not perfect. And that's why you need this thing to become perfect. That's called confirm shaming or they're called forced actions that encourages the customer to take the action. Otherwise, otherwise they are going to have some bad impact. Sometimes, they constantly annoy you, criticize you in one way or the other, make you feel better by making other, like your life compare with other things. That's called lagging technique. And sometimes, sometimes there are subscription traps. You are, you go to their website, they, they want, your, want uh, you to register on their site to get the access. And sometimes signing up for the service is very easy and to get rid of that cancellation, cancelling it is very difficult. Doesn't matter how many times you unsubscribe, the message keep popping, popping and popping. And everything that I mentioned is all about the dark pattern, the unethical user interface design, especially they are being created for the marketing purposes. Okay. Next question we have is with respect to the exchange traded fund called the ETF. What is an exchange trading fund? We'll learn and then we'll come back in a very simple way. Very, very simple way, exchange traded fund ETF is nothing but a marketable security. Why it is called marketable security? Because ultimately, uh, uh, it tracks a commodity bond or a basket of assets very similar to the index fund. ETF is called so because it is exchange traded fund. It's traded on the stock exchange very similarly the way we sell purchase the stocks or 
similarly to the mutual funds even the etf it also pulls the money from investors you know how the mutual funds do if you if you're not sure which particular stock you want to buy so you ultimately go buy some mutual fund mutual fund is nothing it's a pool of many assets some assets will go up some assets will go down so ultimately there is always a balance between that particular box of mutual uh, funds similarly exchange trading funds are very similarly they also pool the money of the investors and channel that into number of baskets and you know all that kind of thing so please remember etf is nothing but a marketable security so if you if you go back to the to the options you can clearly eliminate the other options like for example do you think is it a clearing facility is etf a clearing and settlement facility no it is not are they debt securities they are not even debt securities they are exchange trading fund the word exchange here is very very important is it professionally managed investment fund that pools the money from small to the government do did i ever mention government securities no it has nothing to do with government securities the right answer is c etf is nothing but a marketable security that tracks a commodity bond basket very similar to the index fund so answer is supposed to be question was a medium level but something by eliminating at least at least few options you could have eliminated straight away you may have a confusion between a and c i understand but that that much risk can be taken if you are a 50 50 stage you can still go and get some risk not like you are not aware about anything then don't take the risk but at least you can take a small risk if you are little bit confident next question is 76 with respect to the seed fund scheme for startup in the space sector now this particular kind of fund was launched by which of the following do now talking about the space fund okay so stay with that so i know that um, confederation of indian industry cii cannot be the right answer antriksh corporation is of course a commercial arm of isro may be the case may be new space india limited is also not into this domain my only confusion is with b and c here the right answer is b now what exactly is that i'll i'll, I'll talk and then i'll discuss the uh, question first let's understand the scheme as the scheme says as the scheme is about seed funding seed funding is supporting the startups at the very initial stage so this concept this this seed fund scheme was actually announced by in space that stands for indian national space promotion and authorization center as the word promotion then you can think oh it's a promotion unit so probably this is the one that has uh, that has announced the seed funding scheme so that we can have startups in the space sector as well and those startups which are also focusing on disaster management and urban development the scheme was launched in collaboration with isro's national remote sensing center the scheme talks about giving financial assistance up to 1 crore rupees that is very important and this is important because in the early stage startups with innovative ideas the real problem the real challenge is the seed funding and that's where the in space comes and deliver all the funding requirement what if let's say you have a separate question coming on in space you may expect a separate question on in space as well what is in space it's a independent nodal agency under department of the space to stimulate the private investment in the space sector now this key objective you don't forget in space is created so that to push and get more private money more private investments in the space sector and for that this is the independent nodal agency that we have created and this in space is a single point interface for all the space related activities between isro and all the non government entities so here the right answer that like like i told you is going to be b you may have this confusion of b and c antriksh is more about the commercial operations of isro it's the commercial arm of the isro so more into that activities right so that's why the right answer is supposed to be b this first and fourth though definitely no point so yes the question was little bit medium but could have been attempted at least could have been risked at least if not attempted so it's not like that you always have to take a blind risk sometime calculated risks are also 
going to be done. Next question is very interesting and important. This question is about the bead towel. Do you know no country, no country claims this land? Yes, it, it literally the bead towel means it belongs to nobody. It's a nobody land. It belongs to no country. But where exactly is it is located? Is it between India, China? No. Yemen, Saudi? No. North Korea, South Korea? No. Bir Thawal is actually a very interesting and a disputed territory between Egypt and Sudan and not disputed that I want it or you want it. No. This, this, this is the one space, one place which no country wants. But why? Is it a haunted place? Of course not. There is a very interesting international relations and international border issue that is there with respect to Bir Tawil. So very easy answer, straightforward, map based, places in use kind of question easily can be attempted. First let me, let me show you this very interesting place. Look at the map of Africa, you have the Egypt here and this downside you have Sudan. Okay. Now please look at, like, let me zoom it little bit and every interesting aspects I am going to explain here. So you can see the two border guys. If you look at the border between Sudan and Egypt. So this country is Sudan and then you have the Egypt. Okay. So normally what is the border like, like the border uh, between of course this whole area was under uh, it the whole area was uh, once occupied by the by the uh, British colonialist and uh, as always and everywhere like all the demarcations which are done by the Britishers. Today we all are uh, struggling with their demarcation and the borders that they have created. The best case we have with India, Pakistan. Hai na? So every border created by Britishers are of problematic borders because they have done the border demarcation based on their understanding rather than taking care of the understanding of the people because that's how the colonists work. right? Anyways, the point is look at this, look at this one particular land. Are you able to see this one particular land here? This particular area is called the Bir Tawil area. Okay, now Egypt say I don't want it, Sudan says I don't want it, why? And this is not a small land, let me tell you, this is as equal to as a city of London. Like the area wise, size wise, it is as big as London city, so it's a quite big land, it's not a small land. But the problem is that nobody, can, no country wants it because Egypt, Egypt always recognizes this border, look at this border. Egypt says, okay, I follow this particular border. This is Egypt's version of border between Sudan and uh, Egypt. If you go by this border, so Bir Tawil should belong to Sudan. Okay, fine, no problem. So Egypt is saying Bir Tawil belongs to you and we are following this particular. Why Egypt is doing so? Because by doing so, this Hala Abib triangle then belongs, then going to belong to Egypt. What is so special in this triangle? I'll explain. Sudan says, uh -uh, we don't want beat Tawil. What border they recognize is after this, now that this demarcation is what the Sudan says. Uh, sorry, not, not, not this. Uh, yeah. So they say, okay, the border must go like this. The, the border must go like this. So Sudan says, ah, Bir Tawil belongs to you, my brother, and Halal, Halal, uh, Halal triangle belongs to us. So that way, neither Sudan wants it, nor Egypt wants it, because by whosoever, whosoever country except Bir Tawil, they have to lose the Habibal triangle. And why this triangle is so important? Because of the rich hydrocarbon resources. There is rich hydrocarbon resources in this particular area and accepting Bir Tawil means losing this rich carbon area and that's why between Sudan and Egypt there are two boundaries, there are two borders, one as per inter interpretation of Egypt and as per interpretation of Sudan and that's why you have tensions in this particular area. Now I hope you remember why, why Bir Tawil is called as a country of no man or nobody wants this want this land. So technically, let me tell you, technically, you guys can go there and you guys can set up your own territory because right now nobody is claiming that. 
so you can go and rule at this country of beat tavil you can be their emperor king or whatever you want so it is called as nobody's land so i hope the right answer is in front of you simple places in news answer is egypt and sudan beat tavil next is a bit tough question why the next question is tough i'm not demoralizing you but it's a fact the question is with respect to card on file tokenization this question is difficult but once you understand the concept becomes very easy first of all you need to you need to know what is the meaning of tokenization like let's say if i say if i say like if i have a customer id or if i have a bank id so my bank id is x x x x x let's say some numbers let's say it's a 10 digit 12 digit number let's say so instead of showing my digital like my alpha numeric codes or my digital codes what if the whole banking can be done by hiding my real details and rather than the real number if that whole information is converted into some kind of token token is simple uh, like a symbolical form where it hides all my information makes them more secure well that is the meaning of tokenization so if you if you go by the definition tokenization means what it is a service where unique alternative code is generated to facilitate transaction through the cards involves substituting 16 digit customer card you you know your every debit card credit card uh, they have your, they have this digital 16 digit code right for every credit card every debit card there is a card number and what if what if there is one process where where uh, uh, that number is going to be substituted with any any token so that you can actually protect your information more securely make sense making making some sense this is what the process of tokenization says now if you look at the statement so now you understand the meaning right and right now why it is in news because rbi has enabled rbi has given permission to convert all the information of your credit card or debit card into the tokenization form and that can be done at the issuer bank level so what is a tokenization we already have explained and these tokens are quite unique because they use lots of different combination of cards they use you know requesters device lot of different things they use ultimately they protect your data so if let's say you have a question separate question coming on the benefits of tokenization ultimately token contain no personal information and everything is hidden it's, so that's why it is considered to be the most secure method of completing your digital payments using your cards but exactly not sharing your card details and for that purpose this can, this can be used the tokenization services can be used for online transactions can also be done in the mobile point mobile point of sale transactions or even the app based transactions so that's why the tokenization is considered to be more and more safe in terms of transaction point okay this is important guys now if you look at the other process tokenization and the the uh, other word is de uh, de tokenization that means reverse when you are converting the token information back to the digital information right so remember one thing the the both the process de to uh, de tokenization is what it is simply converting back the token into the actual details so this tokenization and de tokenization both services can be performed by authorized card network or the card user they can do it uh is it mandatory is it compulsory no it is not tokenization is still not mandatory for the customer and uh, uh, it is up to their wish it is up to their uh, thing uh, they can choose tokenization service or they can't what if they choose tokenization service are they going to pay something extra no absolutely no if the customer start or willing to you know use avail the tokenization service from any bank they need not to pay any extra charges it is included in your regular banking services one more thing the customer can request tokenization of his or her card on any number of devices i mean i mean uh, there is no uh, limit of tokenizations where tokens can be used so one customer can use the tokenization service for many number of devices for point of sale for online transaction app transaction so one tokenization 
can be used at multiple devices. Please remember that this is important. If you look at the question, the problem is with statement 3 and statement 4. Why? It says, number one it says, customer need to pay extra charges, charges for tokenization. No, there are no extra fees. The customer can request tokenization only on one device. No, there is no limit. One tokenization service can be available at multiple devices. So that's why third and fourth are wrong. One and two are correct. So answer is only two and let me tell you this of course this was a tough one. It was a tough question. If you are not aware of tokenization then, then it becomes really difficult to solve. In that case you can skip the question. There, because there is absolutely technical details involved and in that case you can't do any guesswork in my opinion. Next question number 79 is very interesting question because there has been news everywhere with respect to Aditya L1 space mission whenever and we know that this is India's mission to study the sun that's not the question the question is specifically with respect to this point in Aditya L1 spacecraft what is this L1 L1 is that particular point called the Lagrange point 1 which is chosen as a place where the uh, the satellite is to be placed and that makes it really important what exactly is this Aditya L1 position is going to be and first before I tell you the question itself says which of the following are the reasons for the for choosing L1 as a point for uh, Aditya mission we'll talk about that first let's try to understand what this L1 L2 L3 is now you have this now you have this thing guys so this is your earth this is your sun so you can see between sun and earth they have chosen a point L1 this is your L1 where we got our Aditya mission placed. This Aditya mission and and this is not just the only point they're like every between any two celestial bodies there are many Lagrangian points what is it what exactly is Lagrangian point is where the where the gravitational forces between the two are settled by the centripetal forces between the two it's a it's a point of balance if, if anything remains at Lagrange point, there is a balance between the gravitational and centrifugal forces so that that particular thing stays there for a longer time without any disturbance. And that is why between, between Sun and the Earth, we have selected L1. There are many such places where you find this balance between gravitational and centrifugal forces. It, they, we have uh, points as L2, point as L3, L4, L5. So they, there are and remember L1, L2, L3 are in a straight line. This is very important guys. Sometimes you may mark this incorrect. You can write L3 here but that is not correct. L1, L2, L3 needs to be in a straight line with L2 on the right and L3 at the left. L4 on top, L5. This, this every point has to be there for every point possible. Now please remember. Out of these five Lagrangian points, this is important guys, out of these five, the L1, L2, L3, the straight line ones, these three are still considered to be unstable point. Why? Because now the satellite is stable at L1, L2, L3, but what if, what if the object place in these points, what if the things get disturbed or drifted away? If any disturbance happens at L1, L2, L3, ultimately that object is going to drift away and that's why there is a requirement of constant adjustment of the positions at L1, L2, L3 and that's why out of the five they are still considered to be unstable points but at, at the same point the L4 and L5 these two points are considered to be very very stable points because even, even if there is any no matter what happens the objects are not, not going to drift away. But of course putting at L4, L5 needs more technical experience, more technical expertise, right? So our Aditya mission is L1 point. That is one thing that you have to remember. Another interesting point that you guys have to remember is another point like why we have put that is important, no? So Lagrange points are the places where gravitational forces between the two systems are, you know, balanced. And uh, they are very perfectly, very interestingly, they are called as the parking spots. Parking spots are like you really do not have to spend much energy on, on the objects put in these points. 
because it's a balanced state point and they are parking why because once you fix your thing into that position it is going going to use minimal uh, fuel consumption it is going to use minimum fuel because it is it just has to stay there does not has to move or do anything so any satellite in the halo orbit around l1 can continuously view the sun without occultation eclipse number one that is one benefit so if if our aditya l1 is at l1 means aditya can constantly see the sun there is absolute no chance of eclipse in between because eclipse because I, and yeah that is not the case with l2 because if we would have put our point at l2 l2 is still because because uh, between l2 and the sun we still have the earth but between l1 and the sun there is no earth in between that's why there is no chance of the eclipse every geomagnetic storm from the sun that heads toward the earth first has to pass through l1 right obviously obviously that's why the l1 is important so every uh, geo geo storm or any so any solar wind has to pass through l1 so a satellite in the halo can track these storms and actually predict their impact even better and also can warn warn the earth a uh, station that such kind of solar storm is coming and you know that these geomagnetic storms they are harmful for the radioactivity at at the earth they are harmful for electrical circuits at the earth so yeah that thing can be done one more point any satellite which is placed in the lagrange can actually remain in a fixed position with minimal fuel consumption so yeah that that is that are all the advantages so if you look at the question guys if you look at the question why they have been chosen in such a way so every statement looks correct except option number 4 because it says object at l1 do not drift away but you have just learned they are still unstable the l4 and l5 are those where no drifting can take place because for l1 l2 and l3 we have learned they can still drift away if they are disturbed so fourth option is incorrect answer is supposed to be 3 um i think this question was definitely tough but but you can still take little bit of risk here if you are if you have read about aditya l1 because at least statement number 3 is very obvious very simple explanation 1 and 2 can also be understood if only only you need to know is this particular location if you have even once seen this particular diagram and you know the position then definitely i can guarantee guys except for point number 3 i i uh, except for point number 4 because point 4 is very difficult to predict i understand but at least first three can be solved easily so that's why the question was tough but i think you can take a take the attempt by a little bit risking it there is no point skipping it at all but in case you have absolutely no clue about aditya l1 or any position then you have no scope but to you know let it go then there is only one option that you guys have now that brings us to the last question that is question number 80 question 80 says the question is about small modular reactors smr what is a small modular reactor first you need to know there are three types of reactors when it comes to nuclear reactor there are three types of reactor guys one the large conventional reactor then we have this 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 one which is our question the small modular reactor and then we have a very latest concept of micro reactor so these small modular reactors they are comparatively smaller and simpler and they are more affordable than the traditional nuclear reactors if you compare the capacity between the large and the conventional uh, large and the small where the larger you know larger uh, nuclear powers they have the average capacity of producing 700 plus megawatt electricity the small modulars are producing somewhere 300 megawatt which is approximately one third of the generating capacity that you can achieve maximum in the nuclear power so in terms of power capacity of course the smaller ones have one third power generating capacity but of course they are smaller and simpler and they are more affordable that is their advantage and this is their kind of disadvantage you can think of course because you can't compare the electricity generation of small with the uh, with the bigger one and if you compare the micro micro they can produce only up to 10 megawatt so they are the least in terms of gen generation capacity 
But again, there is one better part, one good part about the small modular reactors. You can start this reactor with a completely de-energized state without receiving energy from the grid. So they are actually easy to handle and restart if they, and one more advantage, one more advantage, now the government is really focusing on uh, pushing these small nuclear reactors so that India can actually achieve the clean energy transitions. And now, now of course it is not very possible and feasible to establish large nuclear reactors, but these small nuclear reactors in many parts of, the, of India can actually solve the problem. And one good advantage of these reactors are that they consume 30 to 60 percent less water per megawatt per hour as compared to the traditional ones. So that is one very good advantage of using the small modular reactors. And at the same time, these small modular reactors, they also require less frequent refueling. Like, like, like a large traditional nuclear reactor, it needs to be refueled after every one or two years. But here the smaller ones, you need to refuel between three to seven years. So once you load them, you are good to go for three to seven years without even, you know, worrying for all this uh, refueling and all that stuff. So there are advantages. The only thing is, is the less energy output, which is obvious because they are small modular reactors. But there was a problem with the first statement. Why? We just have understood. What is the energy capacity of small modular? It is 30? No, it is 300 megawatt. And that's why first is incorrect. If you know this much only, you can straight away get your answer. The first being incorrect and the second is correct. Yes, second is correct because we know that these small modular ones require less water, require less frequent, uh, frequent refueling. So here the answer is supposed to be D. It was a medium question but could have been attempted because you, you can still understand the smaller one can't be this much small. It has to be more than that because this comes somewhere for the micro category. So with that logic, the first can be eliminated and second is very obvious because uh, that could be the advantage. So do read more about the small modul modular and also prepare the micro uh, reactors even because I have seen many questions coming on the micro reactor as well. So that is all from my side guys. Uh, this was a discussion on 20 questions that we have done. I really hope you have enjoyed our class and you must have learned a lot of new things. So what was your favorite part? I am really eager to know. Do tell me in the comment section box how you find this video. Was it helpful? Was the discussion up to the mark? Do tell us in the feedback section. Thank you so much. See you guys in the next video soon. Till then, all my best wishes and lots of love. Keep preparing hard. All my best wishes. Take care. Jai Hind. Jai Bharat.